very much indeed, and it's, uh, it's very good to see so many of you here, uh, but also to catch up again with Joe. So back in 2013, I was the minister responsible for mental health, and I was interested in how we reduce the use of restrictive practices, particularly restraint. Uh, I had become convinced that this was a practice which traumatised many people and had to be confronted. And I heard about work underway at Merseycare. I hadn't realised that Jennifer and Danny were behind it. But I came up to see a ward where uh, they were trialling uh, No Force First. And I watched uh, a group of people in the ward um, listening to a cellist from the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. Uh, it was inspiring and it felt like a very different atmosphere to what you would expect uh, in an inpatient ward. Uh, and, and so I began to realise that Mersey Care and Joe as a chief executive were sort of pioneering new thinking in uh, mental health and with learning disability and autism and so I've got a great admiration for a leader who is willing to take risks and to confront unacceptable practices and to make change happen. Um, there was a moment after we looked at this ward where Joe was determined to take me to see a new hospital that was being built and so he got me into his car uh, and we headed off towards this hospital. I think it might have been in Highton, possibly, I can't remember. Anyway, clearly Joe didn't know either because he got completely lost. Um, at least this was his claim, because he had me in that car for about half an hour, captive audience with the minister, and he spent half an hour uh, lecturing me on the importance of reducing the, the loss of life through suicide. He, had become a very strong advocate of the zero suicide movement. Uh, and that, in, incidentally, really influenced my thinking. So it was a very valuable half hour. But the mischievous so-and-so, I nearly used a bad word there, uh, had managed to capture me in his car in order to uh, deliver the message to me very, very effectively. So it's great to be back here again. And Joe, in talking about Jennifer and Danny, how they had initiated that No Force First trial and now initiated work on ending the use of long-term segregation. These are two people who I have the greatest admiration for. Uh, and the work they have done to deliver this HOPES programme is really impressive and I think they deserve a big round of applause. Now, I've chaired the oversight group for the HOPES programme, and it's been an enormous pleasure to be involved in this programme, but I wanted to thank everybody who's been on that oversight group. But in particular, I also, beyond Danny and Jennifer, I wanted to thank all of the HOPES practitioners. Can I just ask those who are present to put their hands up so I can just see There's some over there <coughs> dotted in the air all over the place. Well look, thank you so much for the absolutely invaluable work that you have done over this last period. It is critically important and it is changing people's lives. So you should all be immensely proud of the work that you've done and I want to express my appreciation and I think again they deserve our appreciation for the work that they've done. Right. Also there's a whole group of people, people with lived experience as Joe has said, who have been deeply involved in this programme, led I should say by the brilliant uh, Gavin Harding. I jointly chaired a learning disability oversight board at the Department of Health back in uh, that period in 2012 to 15 with Gavin. He was brilliant then. He always used to go on teasing me about my politics. He had become the Labour mayor of his town, the first man with a learning disability to become a mayor of a town. 
massively impressive bloke and so sad that he can't be with us today. I wanted to enjoy a reunion with Gavin and all of the people with lived experience who have played their part in this programme, they have made a massive difference to people's lives as well and they deserve our appreciation. Give them a round of applause please. When I was Minister, I had to deal with the aftermath of uh, the Winterbourne View scandal, where people with a learning disability, autistic people, uh, had been appallingly abused uh, in Winterbourne View, a private uh, hospital. Uh, and what I became conscious of is that this wasn't a unique uh, experience, that there was abuse going on, and that there is a risk behind locked doors, away from public view, there is a risk of abuse of power. And we have to be conscious of that. Uh, if we don't think that it could happen in our own institutions, then it increases the risk that it will happen. Uh, sometimes there are bad people who do bad things, uh, and we allow it to happen too often. Uh, but I also became conscious that the very model of placing people in institutions for years and years on end, often starting in teenage years, was an unacceptable practice which we had to confront. <coughs> so we initiated the Transforming Care Programme and it was one of the greatest frustrations of my time as a minister that that programme has not delivered the scale of change that it should have done. It was the right programme, uh, but the barriers to change are very powerful, including massive investment in, private, in the private sector in new buildings to provide a model of care which is not acceptable. I visited a young girl aged 15 called Forzia when I was minister at the invitation of her family. Uh, she was in an institution. She'd been there for about two years. She was treated essentially like an animal. She was often ripping all of her clothes off and running around naked. Uh, she was constantly restrained. She had almost no access to the outside world. Um, uh, her life was miserable. And as her behaviour worsened, the restrictions on her tightened even further. And I was frankly horrified by what I saw that day. And I went back to the department and said, we have to review her case and get her out of this place. We eventually managed to do that. And I went back to see her two years later in a new place where she was enjoying life. And I could not believe the woman who walked into the room she was a transformed person, full of talk. She asked me when my birthday was, I think it was at about May, and I said it was the 16th of September, and she said, that's a Saturday. And her brain was doing something that no one else in that room could manage. Uh, and I asked them, how often has she been restrained since she left this institution? Not once. So it was the alien environment with staff who had not been trained in understanding how autism affected that individual, uh, which was causing the distress and the behaviour uh, that got worse and worse. Once she was out of that alien environment, she thrived. Still complex, still sometimes challenging, but living a good life. And so my message is that we have to confront inhuman, unacceptable practices and we cannot relent until we have ended these awful practices. Now I wanted to just say something about the detail of this programme. So I chair the South London and Maudsley in London, in South East London, and we had a, a migrant uh, male who had been in long-term segregation. I'd seen it for myself uh, for a long time, over a year. Uh, I raised it, nothing had changed. The view of the people in charge of his care was that there was no alternative. That's a really important point. 
Uh, and then the Hope's practitioner turns up, and it was deeply impressive. And he had a lasting effect on the culture of the people working on that ward. And that is the critical thing that we have to do, because ultimately we will fail if we get people out and they're simply replaced by new people coming in. That is what has to end. Now I just want to sh tell you some highlights of the programme. It supported 89 people in long-term segregation, 73 adults, 16 children. 63 of those are now out of long-term segregation, 71% of the people that the practitioners have worked with. And I just want you to pause for a moment to just think about the effect on all of those people, the 63 people who are now out of long-term segregation and how their lives have been improved. But I was talking to Jennifer last night because it's not just those. There are some others who remain in long-term segregation but whose lives have now been significantly improved and they are on a journey towards ending uh, long-term segregation in those cases. So the individual stories, which I'll come back to in a moment, are also very powerful. And at least five of the people they worked with are now living back in the community where they belong. Uh, there has been a significant increase in physical health plans. It is remarkable how, as a system, we neglect the physical health needs of people with a learning disability and autistic people. We know that they die years and years before others, and yet we continue to fail to meet their physical health needs. Not acceptable, and it has to change. We have trained 2,694 clinical staff in the HOPES approach with very positive feedback. We've trained NHS England case managers and CQC lead inspectors. We've developed uh, a HOPE certificate and a diploma working with BUILD and the Restraint Reduction Network. And we've developed communities of practice working with people with lived experience, helping cultural change to happen. We've created a clinical guide, I think it's on the tables, again working with people with lived experience. An independent evaluation this is the point that Joe made. Uh, show that there is a return on investment of 12 to 1. That is a substantial reduction in cost. And what's that, what that's telling us is that long-term segregation is both very expensive and wrong. And the two together make for a very compelling case for change. But I wanted to end by just <coughs> summarising that we have important discussions today, as Joe has said, but be in no doubt there is a moral duty to see this through. We cannot justify treating people as second-class citizens, worse than that. Culture does not change overnight, but it has to change. <coughs> Long-term segregation is an unacceptable model and we now know it is possible to avoid it. And this is a message particularly for the Care Quality Commission because I want the heat, I want providers to feel the heat. The Care Quality Commission should not be finding it acceptable for providers to continue to use this practice. There should be consequences for continuing to flout people's human rights. So that is a measure that could start to turn the screw and to make change happen. Now we have to find a way of continuing this work, of maintaining the momentum now we've started. We cannot lose it, as Joe has said, happens to so many programmes. That would be wholly unacceptable, indeed scandalous, if this was lost. So it has to be maintained. And we have to ultimately end the practice of long-term segregation. Thank you very much indeed.